Well, it's good to be with you. We're still getting accustomed to be in America instead of being in Scotland. I feel as if I've gone, gone back in time. Just a little bit, five hours, isn't it? And then we're getting used to your accent. And I'm going to inflict you with mine this evening. Now, Colin, in the morning, he quoted John 3, 16 in Zulu and in Afrikaans. Would you like to hear it in my language? It's not broad Scots. Now, see if you can understand any of it. Or a sound much show of Gragish Chia and Sul, Gunuke in a yin week fein, a homer skip and yaka hedges on a scrissere, a commi a vehiri eke. Hands up those who understood that. Well, you did look intelligent. Well, that's the language that I grew up with in the Hebrides. That's the language that I speak still to my people there. And I went to school to learn English. So I'm inflicting you with my English this evening. Now, the pastor suggested that maybe I should sing first of all, and I was a little bit reticent about singing without music until I heard Paula this morning now, if she can do it, I'll try to do it too. Uh, traditionally, this is the way we sing in the Hebrides, in Gaelic, not in English. Because this song that I'm going to sing to you has a bearing on what I'm going to say this evening. So listen carefully to the words. Oh, how well I remember in the old-fashioned days when some old-fashioned people had some old-fashioned ways. In the old-fashioned meetings, as they tarried there, in the old-fashioned manner, how God answered their prayer. T'was an old-fashioned meeting in an old-fashioned place where some old-fashioned people had some old-fashioned grace. As an old-fashioned sinner, I began to pray. And God heard me and saved me in the old-fashioned way. There was singing, such singing of those old-fashioned airs. There was power, such power in those old-fashioned prayers. An old-fashioned conviction made the sinner pray. And the Lord heard and saved him in the old-fashioned way. Well, they say it is better, things have changed, don't you know? And the people in general seem to think it is so. And they call me old-fashioned when I dare to say that I like it far better in the old-fashioned way. If the Lord never changes as the fashions of men, if he's always the same, why he is old-fashioned then? As an old-fashioned sinner, saved through all time grace, oh, I'm sure he will take me to an old-fashioned place. T'was an old-fashioned meeting in an old-fashioned place where some old-fashioned people had some old-fashioned grace. As an old-fashioned sinner, I began to pray. And God heard me and 
saved me in the old fashioned way. Going to read to you now from Psalm 126. It's a well known psalm, it only has six verses in it. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Just a word of prayer. Our Father, we pray that thou wilt still our hearts in thy presence. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that the anointing of thy Spirit might be upon us this evening. Come, Holy Ghost, our hearts inspire. Let us thine influence prove source of the old prophetic fire, fountain of light and love. Come, Holy Ghost, for moved by thee the prophets wrote and spoke. Unlock the truth, thyself the key. Unseal the sacred book. In Jesus' name, amen. As has been said, I was born and brought up in the Hebridean Islands. I hope you've got your geography right and that you know exactly where that is. You know where Great Britain is. And if you take the most northwesterly point of Scotland, it is called Cape Wrath, well named. And 40 miles into the sea west of that is a string of islands and the topmost island is called the Island of Lewis. And two miles from the lighthouse at the very top of the Island of Lewis, I was born and brought up in a fishing village. I want to give you a little bit of background in as far as the church is concerned, was concerned there. I was accustomed to being on family worship in the morning, not only in our own home, but in the home of friends whom I called on in the morning, and my grandparents, and it was the normal thing in every home in the village, as far as I know, to have family worship. That doesn't mean that all the people in the village were Christians, but they had promised in the church to bring up their children in the nurture and fear and admonition of the Lord. And they felt that this was part and partial of the fulfillment of that promise that they had made in public. And so my unconverted parents and other unconverted parents in the village felt it was right to read the word of God to their family and to pray. The prayer was always the same amongst the unconverted, they probably had learned it from their parents and so on. So we were well versed in the scripture. I can't say that I listened very carefully to the reading of the word in our home. I used to count the tax, the protectors in my father's shoes where he, when he knelt there to say the, say the prayer. I wasn't at all attentive to what was happening. It was just part of life. And then in the day school, in the curriculum of the day school, we started the day with the Lord's Prayer, and then we went on to Bible stories, and then we were drilled in the Presbyterian Shorter Catechism. And as a child, I used to come home struggling to learn repentance is a saving grace, whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, doth with grief and hatred turn from it to God with full purpose of an endeavor after new obedience. That's a mouthful for a child, isn't it? 
And then the hymn book of the church was the Psalms, the metrical version of the Psalms, as we sing them in Scotland. So we had to learn them in school. And most days we came home from primary school, we came home to learn another verse of a psalm. So you can see we were well versed in the scripture. We knew the Ten Commandments. We could recite them off by heart. We knew Isaiah 53 in two languages. We could recite them off by heart. And, Sa and Isaiah 55 and the Beatitudes and uh, Corinthians 13 and so on. So you could find unconverted people who could quote the scriptures. Now the reason I'm telling you that is because when the Spirit of God fell upon the island, there was fuel there to burn. The people knew the word of God. They weren't strangers to it. Something else that will be of interest to you is the fact that there were those among the people of God who were still dissatisfied and who were craving and longing for a movement of the Spirit of God in the islands. And before that time, it was about every 10 years, there was an outpouring of the Spirit of God. In 1939, there was an outpouring of the Spirit of God greater than the 1949. And so there were people who had lived through not only one revival, but two revivals. It's a healthy sign when a child or an adult is hungry and the people of God were hungry. I was on the mainland of Scotland when the revival broke out, and I wasn't particularly interested in church. I only went once to Sunday school, and the elder prayed too long a prayer for me, and I didn't go back again. So that's a little word of warning to the elders and the deacons or whoever. But I was on the mainland when the revival broke out, and my reaction, immediate reaction was, I'm not going back to Lewis until this revival is over. They were religious enough already, and I don't want to become involved. I had my own life, I had my own ambitions. I used to sing at the Gaelic concerts and so on, and my word was full of pleasure, and it didn't include the church. I saw nothing in it. Oh, I knew that there were people who were converted. I knew there were children of God, and I believed that they were children of God. And I believed furthermore that I was going to hell. But there were so many people going to hell with me that it didn't concern me too much. That was my attitude. Okay, if God would come at some time or other in my life and save me, well, that was his business. But as far as I was concerned, I had no desire for the things of God. A phone call changed all that. A phone call to say that my parents were ill and I must come immediately to Lewis. I came concerned about them. They were soon better and they were soon going to church with the others. And it seemed that the whole conversation of the village revolved around what was happening in these meetings. And I, I hated it. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I felt inwardly disturbed when they started to talk about meetings and started to talk about conversions and people who had been drunkards who were now praying in the prayer meeting. I, 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 I resisted and I resented talking because basically I was afraid. You know, the Bible says the sinners in Zion are afraid, fearfulness encompass us, the hypocrite. And so there I was, afraid of the supernatural, afraid that God would come to my life, that God would speak to me, because that was an area that was foreign to me, and I didn't want to have anything to do with the things of God. I hoped that maybe at the end of life I might be saved, but not now. I had too much on. My parents were strict, and one night they found me out. And they said they weren't going to the meeting unless I would go too. And I went in a rage. And you know where folk like me would sit in a meeting like that? Right at the back, as far back as I could in the church. The church was packed. 
Now I want to give you a little insight into what was happening. The church was crowded. The atmosphere was indescribable. One sensed as one came in the drive towards the church, a silence already falling upon the people. And as they went into the church itself, they moved slowly into their pews and they sat. And sometimes before the service began at all, the tears were flowing. And for a person who is unconverted to be in such a situation was not a very comfortable thing. But as I listened to the singing of the Psalms, and that was all they did sing, the Psalms, they were singing the Word of God. And they were singing as if their hearts would burst. And the singing sent shivers down my spine. I felt I was being, as it were, hounded into a corner. And when the preacher got up, the late Duncan Campbell, I knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that this man was in earnest. He stormed up and down, sometimes down the pulpit steps. And the perspiration rolled down his face. He didn't preach a soft gospel. Though the wicked join hand in hand, they shall not go unpunished. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. Hell was made real to us, and sin was made a reality. And our condition out of Christ was such as ought to make us fear, and we did fear. Well, I went home that evening in a daze after that meeting. And as I entered the door, my father said, well, Mary, how did you enjoy that? I said, I didn't enjoy it at all. Now, that was true. I didn't enjoy it. But I, I, I wanted him to know that I found no delight at all in what happened in that meeting. But strangely, the following night, I was there again. They didn't have to ask me to go anymore. Because of the drawing, I didn't know that was what it was at the time. You know, there's a word that says, and you know it well, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And I was lost, and the Son of God was seeking me, although I didn't know it. I went again and again and again. It seemed in a way that I was going against my will, but my feet were taking me there. Even though it meant a walk of two and a half miles, sometimes in wintry weather, but we walked and we went. And everywhere around us, you didn't, you didn't need to go to church to sense what was going on. When the Spirit of God is outpoured, why it seemed as if God was everywhere. I listened at the door of my father's bedroom, and I could hear that hardened sailor crying out aloud the prayer of the public, and, oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. One night in the meeting, I kept my eye on my mother, and I thought, well, if this, if this new birth business, if this conversion doesn't come to our home, it, it won't be so bad. I can put up with it. It's in the lives of others. But there's something that I can't resist. And this night, as I looked at my mother, I saw her taking out her handkerchief, and the tears coursed down her cheeks. And I thought, oh, my, what are we going to say to mother tonight? And our house was very quiet that night. We moved around as if we were moving in a dream. Nobody wanted to talk. You know, sometimes that awareness of the presence of God comes to us in church. It was in our homes. It was there. It was in the neighborhood. I walked the street, and it seemed as if a record was going around in my mind, walking the village street. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. 
wafer? Do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. And so it would go on to the end of the chapter. Then who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? But he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He is despised and we esteemed him not. And so it went on and on to the end of the chapter. And there was I, an ungodly young girl who had no interest in church. I was in my teens, and I'm walking the street, and that word of God is pounding through my consciousness. Then it came again. I remember the word of God coming to me, walking along a dust road from another village. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. And instinctively, I stepped off the road onto the verge. And I felt I shouldn't be there either. And I went back and I felt I shouldn't be there either. I felt I didn't belong. I had no right to trample God's creation. It was a case of where every prospect pleases and only man is vile. I went out with Dad in the boat, looked down into the depth of the sea, watching the fish as they swam. And all I could think of was God made them. God did it. This is God's creation. God is everywhere. I wish I could transport you back in time to these services to sense that solemnity of eternity. You know what's wrong with us today in our services is there's no awareness of eternity. No awareness of eternity. Uh, and may I say, sometimes there is no relationship in our Christianity to eternity. It's all in time, and it's all what, it will, what will benefit me, and it's all to do with me and with other people. But it's divorced from eternity. But it seemed as, at, at, as if at that time eternity was so near, and the prayers of the people of God. Can you imagine an elder standing up to pray? with his hands uplifted to God and praying for the young people of the community, the tears coursing down his cheeks. And I'm sitting as a teenager holding onto my seat with the fear of God in my heart, seeing myself as he described us on the slippery paths of darkness, slipping down, slipping down, slipping down to an endless hell. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In the midst of revival, one is so concerned about oneself that one doesn't observe very much of what is happening in other people's lives. But one night I observed it, and I saw what it meant to be saved. I saw what happened when Christ saved a life. For the first time, I went to one of the cottage meetings that happened after the services in the church were over. And these cottage meetings went on into the night. I've come home at 6 o'clock in the morning from these cottage meetings. People didn't want to part the one from the other. And the presence of God was so wonderful, but so, so fearful to others and so fearful to me. And this particular night, they made some kind of appeal for those who were exercised about their souls that they should come to a room that was cleared for that purpose and the preacher would pray with them. I thought it's another meeting. In my ignorance, I thought it's another meeting and I want to go to meetings now. I want to. You see the drawing power of the Spirit of God. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. I went into that meeting and I was horrified when I saw that it was just those who were anxious about their souls who were there. Two of my childhood friends were there, two girls from the village, and they sat and wept their hearts out. I didn't feel quite like that yet. 
And Duncan Campbell asked the one, are you really in earnest about seeking Christ as your Savior? And I thought, wow, he's going to ask me that. What shall I say? I can't say to the good man, no. Then he said, well, why am I here? And I said, yes. But oh, I felt so convicted. I felt such a hypocrite. But God knew my heart, and God knew that in my ignorance, I did desire something I didn't know what. And I was now being drawn irresistibly to the things of God. After he had prayed with us and for us, I thought, well, it's wonderful to hear someone praying for me. I've never heard anyone praying for me personally like this before. And my heart responded to it, but I felt Duncan Campbell can't save me. He can't, he can give me all the promises in the book, but God must witness in my heart for myself. I, I want something that can't be explained on a human basis. I, I want God to do it for me. Uh, and so after he had prayed with us, we went out onto the street. And that night I saw what God had done to my teenage friends. There they were out on the street at two o'clock in the morning, arms linked, singing, take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name. But his love abideth ever through eternal years the same. Oh, they sang the height and depth of mercy. Oh, the length and breadth of love. Oh, the fullness of redemption, pledge of endless life above. I looked at the faces of these young people. I looked at one girl in particular, and I saw something that I desired more than anything in my life. I felt you've got something that I haven't got and I can never be at rest until I find it. Do you remember the psalmist said, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish thou the work of our hands. I saw the beauty of the Lord in the face of that young girl. Three o'clock that morning I was on my knees by the old stove in the kitchen praying, oh God, and I meant it. Be merciful to me, the sinner, as if there was no other sinner in the world, the sinner. I didn't feel that anything happened. I went up to my bed. Don't know whether it was that night or the following night. I wept myself to sleep. I was lost, 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 and I didn't know how to get saved. And I didn't feel that God was under any obligation to save me. I'd left him out of my life all my days. I had no interest in his church, in his house, in his people all my days. How could I now ask God to give me a ticket to heaven to save my soul? The following night, I was at the church an hour before the service started. There were others too there. All oh, the hunger in the hearts of men and women and young people after God. How they hungered, how they longed. The preacher preached an hour long every night. Nobody looked at the watch. Nobody looked at the clock. And, and, and we felt when he came to the benediction, we felt disappointed that he should stop. And even the benediction spoke to our hearts. Even the benediction. And then off we would go in search of another meeting and another meeting. And for three months, I struggled and I struggled. I saw some wonderful sights, some wonderful sights. I heard some wonderful prayers, earnest prayers. I met some wonderful people, the people of God. And how we, there was no generation gap, none whatsoever. The young people and the old people went together. There was no consciousness of age. How we longed for these old people to tell us more and more. We used to go vi visit a saint who was 90 years of age, and she used to admonish us and, and instruct us in the Word of God. We used to, to read to her and pray with her. And there we were in the midst of the people of God. But I had no assurance of salvation, not for myself. I believed that anybody and everybody else could get saved, but there was some kind of something in me whereby I couldn't get the assurance of salvation. 
But one night, at the end of my tether, on the 24th of August, 1950, I was sitting as usual in the prayer meeting, and the men were praying, one after the other, and the minister got up to close in prayer. I prayed in my heart. Do you know what I said? I said, oh God, I love your people. I can't explain it, but I love your people and I want to be in their, in their company. And Lord, I want to stay in their company for the rest of my life and then send me to hell, for that's what I deserve. You know, the conviction of sin in a season of revival is too terrible for words. Here was I brought up in a society that was moral, religious, and any immorality would have been frowned upon. And yet I felt such a sinner in the sight of God that I couldn't see how he could save me. But that night, as the minister closed in prayer, he quoted a verse that I have already quoted to you, Isaiah 53 and verse 5. And suddenly it seemed as if I was transported from that prayer meeting to the place called Calvary, and I was there alone. He was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement of your peace was upon him, and with his stripes you are healed. And I felt healed. Nobody needed to tell me. The Spirit of God, through his word, witnessed with my spirit that miracle of miracles, I was a child of God. I couldn't go to bed that night. A crowd of us walked the shore, of singing above the noise of the waves, now none but Christ can satisfy. None other name for me, there's love and life and lasting joy, Lord Jesus, found in thee. Following day at my loom, weaving Harris tweet, of which you probably have heard, the loom was rattling away and the shuttle flying and the pattern unfolding, and I was conscious that God had a pattern for my life. I felt I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. Calvary was so real. Calvary was so fresh. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. But again, the question came, but who am I? There are all these fine young men who are being saved in the revival. They can go. They can go to the ends of the earth. They can go into the ministry and so on. But they closed the service with the psalm again and again, Psalm 45 and verse 10. Hearken, O daughter, and consider, and incline thine ear. Forget thine own people and thy father's house. And this thundered in my inner consciousness. And it seemed as if I was being estranged, even from the revival. And I would leave my loom and go upstairs, and I would pray and travel through the whole village, every family, every home, every person, and then to the ends of the earth. God had opened my eyes. I wasn't my own anymore. I was bought with a price. But the arguments continued. We traveled here and there throughout the island. Nothing was a bother. No place too far away. Sixty miles we would go in an old lorry, clinging on in the back, and walking through the snow two, three miles. As the winter came in, we would go to the meetings. Our hearts aflame. Our, our, we, 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 we were filled with laughter. Our tongue was filled with singing. Hymns were being composed all over the place. People who were almost illiterate found themselves flowing in verse after 
after verse after verse of spiritual songs, singing, making melody in our hearts to the Lord. Glory filled the land. And the people of God were rejoicing. They could hardly contain themselves. They were so overjoyed, and yet the tears were never far away as the burden would come upon them for others. Someone wrote from London, a young girl, to her parents, why didn't you tell me about Jesus? I found him here in London. Somebody else from the island, a way at sea on board ship, why did you tell me? I fell on me on the ship, and I found Christ as my Savior. And so all over, loose people all over the world, as they heard the, 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 the news of the revival, came under conviction where they were, and came to Christ. God wasn't confined to what wasn't confined to I could describe some scenes after these meetings of young people gathering together. I remember one night a crowd of young men strong young island the meeting is so and they shall go of them sitting on a couch with the white handkerchiefs spread over their faces and fins and sobbed and sobbed in the One night, the camel was preaching. We could hardly hear him because of the distraction of the people at the back of the house in the kitchen. And the kitchen was full of young people. And they were weeping in the kitchen. Young people who were strange to listen to God. There they were repenting of their sin. Remember another night, Duncan Campbell coming into a room, and it was, it, there was a bed in the room. Every room was filled. The stairs in the home was way up and in the rooms upstairs a strong voice and you hear the, the room and there was the young the head in the little head whole crowd of their heads in the middle and their knees 